the first thing they're going to check is a person's credit score to make sure that they have the ability to repay the loan. In your credit score, it is based on five parts. You guys don't really need to know this. I don't believe there's a test question, but just so you know down the road, the number one most important part in uh, your credit score is your ability to repay, your repayment history. That's like 35% of your score. So there's five numbers and one of them is more than a third of the total. What is your history? Late payments, missed payments, all of those affect your credit score way more than anything else. All right. So the payment history is the first thing. Now, the second thing they're going to check is what they call a person's debt to income ratio. The slang that you hear that called is called a DTI. A person's debt to income ratio. All right. So it's debt over income. What they are looking for, and the general rule of thumb that you hear this called, is what they call the 2836 rule. The 2836 rule. All right. So, what they're saying here is two different things. One, this number here is called the front end number. Any guess what the bottom one's called? It's called the back end number. They're pretty tricky on how they name this, all right? So what they're trying to tell you is the front end number deals mainly with your housing. And it works like this. What they're saying is if your number is 28, 28% of your income can go towards your housing. So if your client says, well, I make $5,000 a month, 28% of that means that's how much the house payment can be, all right? That's how much they can allot towards a house payment. If they clear the 28%, then the, and clear, I'm using in quotes, then they look at, the back end number, and the back end number deals with all of your other bills. All right, now here, don't panic. Here is another word that lenders use differently than you and I would use. To a lender, bills are things that would show up on your credit report. A visa card, car loan, student payment, housing counts. But what doesn't count is all of the other stuff that you probably spend money on. Utilities, Netflix, gambling, all of that food, all of that comes out of the other 64% of your income. All right? So... The big problem with that, and I mentioned it earlier, is that 36% includes the housing we just calculated. So watch this. Really, what that leaves them is 8% because we spent 28% on our housing. So this leaves 8%. So 8% times 5,000 means they've only got $400 left to spend on their bills, okay? So if a person comes in and says, well, I wanna buy this house and I've only got one car payment, it's $300 a month, they would qualify, okay? So that's how it works. They would say, I wanna buy this house and you would do a uh, loan calculation and say, well, your payment's about 900 bucks. That qualifies for less than 
What other bills do you have? Well, I've got a Visa card, it's $23 a month, and I got my car payment, it's $350 a month. Okay, so that's $370, that's less than $400. This person would actually qualify under the 2836 rule. This would allow a lender, as long as their credit score is good, to use that person to get qualified for a loan. Everybody see what I'm getting at? Maybe? No? Let's do something else then. Because, and here's where the benefit comes in. There are lenders that may do 30, 50 are their front end number, back end number. Matter of fact, if you call a mortgage broker and go, hey, what's your front end, back end number? They would probably hang up on you because they'd be so shocked that you understand what they're talking about. They'd have to call you back and go, hey man, I'm sorry. You scared me, you actually knew what we do. Yes, I do. So you could say, well, I got this guy who's got a lot of car payments, drives a Ferrari. He's not gonna qualify for a 2836. Have you got anything else? Yeah, we got another lender that will do 3050. Oh, he'll qualify for that. But here's the kicker. The 2836 guy that passed may get the great interest rate today. The, this guy, because he has to go to a 3050, and that means there's more risk to the lender and risk translates to reward and reward translates to a higher interest rate so this guy here may get a loan but it may be here so when someone says i don't qualify for a loan technically i can qualify anybody for a loan it just says, at what interest rate are you going to get? Potentially, if some FHA allows a 55 back end number, that's the highest I know. 55% of your income can go towards your bills. That is typically, now I'm not talking FHA, another lender, that gives you a 55, maybe a 7% loan. And, you, and the buyer goes, well, I really don't want 7%. Okay, I get it. But I still could have got you that loan. All right? And that's all based upon a person's debt to income ratio or their DTI. Now, there's one other thing that we've touched on earlier, but I want to make sure that we talk about this again. I have been using this words interchangeably, and we're going to change that right now. These two people are different people. A lender is the person who actually puts their hand in their pocket and pulls money out, as opposed to a mortgage broker. Notice the word in there broker. They do the exact same thing that we do, only we are real estate brokers where we find a buyer and a seller to bring them together. A mortgage broker does the exact same concept. They bring a buyer of money and a seller of money together. So a mortgage broker will work with a lender okay so now let follow me on this could a buyer of a house walk right up to the owner of the house and go hey you want to sell your house very good right that's called a for sale by owner but for the buyer to save some time he would use a real estate broker and he would tell the real estate broker, I want a three bedroom, two bath, 1500 square feet, 
and then he goes back to work and the real estate broker searches the MLS and Zillow and Trulia and Google base and all of that and finds all of these properties, shows them to the buyer and goes, which one do you want to go look at? Right. A mortgage broker is the same concept. A borrower of money could walk into Chase Bank and go, hey, you're a lender, I need money. And Chase go, well, we don't want to deal with you, you're wrong credit or uh, wrong DTI. So he has to walk across the street and go to Nat City and go, hey, I want to borrow money. Or he could go to a mortgage broker, give the mortgage broker all of his information, and that mortgage broker then go and shop all these lenders and come back to the borrower of money and go, here's five lenders, which one do you want? So do you guys see the analogy between a mortgage broker and a real estate broker? It's the same concept. It's just they bring buyers and sellers of money together. I'm always in favor of using a mortgage broker because they have several different outlets that if you bring your client to them and say, hey, here's my client, and he says, well, I, I need this, I need a 30-50 rule. That mortgage broker can go, oh, well, we can't go to Chase, but I can take you to Carrington, or I, we can go to United, or I can get a better rate with that same number at Quicken. So using a mortgage broker to me is always a smarter and better deal because they have, they deal with many different lenders, all right? So make sure you understand that terminology is now different between these two it is a mortgage broker versus the lender. And we're going to get into this in just a second.